Okay. Thank you very much for everyone attending uh, today's uh, talk and also for those who will be attending online. So today we have a collaboration with the and also the Faculty of Law's Lord Leary uh, Constantine Educational Series of Academic Year 2021-2022. And we are having our inaugural webinar on digital justice. What should a Caribbean court system fit for the 21st century look like? And I'm now going to hand over to Terence, who is also part of the at University of West Indies, St. Augustine. Terence. Yeah, thank you very much, Dean Heffron, and welcome to everyone. Um, as the first honorary fellow at the Faculty of Law, um, the last in-person conf conference that I successfully organized in collaboration with the Copper Foundation took place um, on the 27th of February, 2020. It was chaired by the Dean, then Dean of the Faculty, uh, Professor Rosemary Antoine. And this pre-COVID event was held at the No Hassanali uh, Auditorium. And it focused on the timely theme of mindset change and crime prevention and how seeing the other can reduce crime and ignite economic growth. Now with the new uh, Dean, Professor Raphael Heffron at the, uh, you know, at the faculty and my reappointment as honorary fellow, I have opted to use my role to further accentuate the work of the faculty and the Copper Foundation mm -hmm. under the umbrella of the Lord Larry Constantine Educational Series. I launched the series in 2018 uh, in honor of Baron Constantine and the legendary, he's a legendary West Indian cricketer, uh, lawyer and politician. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Sorry, I'm, 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 hello? I think so, someone is muted, I think. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Baron Constantine is the UK's first black peer and he's also the first high commissioner for Trinidad and Tobago to the UK. And he, will, he made world history in the realm of global justice, law, and diplomacy. And he was a relentless campaigner for the systematic fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. I wanted everyone to sort of just get a little idea as to who Lord Constantine is. Could you just show the video here, please? Thank you. Nelson, Radical Nelson on Meredith Street and we were privileged in Nelson to welcome our Connie, better known as Lord or Sir Leary Constantine, the first ever professional black cricketer in this country and the first black peer of this country, who in his uh, lordly title mentions is from the Caribbean but also from Nelson in the County Palatine of Lancashire. Connie was really well loved here and he enjoyed the spirit of the Nelson people. But there's more to this place than Constantine. He invited C.L.R. James to lodge with him at this house on Meredith Street. He came and he was going to do mainly sports reporting and he would do some newspaper articles but not so political. When he arrived in Nelson, he came in contact with many local radicals. Nelson has an history of radical thinkers, self-educated people, and there was an easy alliance between James and the local people. It changed his entire writing career. And indeed, a local Nelson man lent him the money to go to Paris to do his research for his seminal book, The Black Jacobins. You can see why we're proud of this place. Right. 
Right. So there you get a, a, a quick glimpse into Lord Constantine's background. And I mean, those of you can do further research, but at least today, what we want to do is to honor him um, with this first webinar. And we have the, dis our distinguished guest speakers, Trinidadian Dr. Camille Khan, a lawyer who now sits as a tax judge, co tax court judge with the UK's Ministry of Justice, and he chairs the Prince Charles Trust Ex Offenders Program in London. And he's also a DCI fellow at Stanford University, United States. And then we have Mr. Al, Alistair Murray, the Deputy CEO at Capita, one of the United Kingdom's largest and fastest growing providers of integrated professional support services. Capita specializes in consulting, transformation, and digital services. So with them on board and uh, Professor Efron as moderator, uh, we are gonna have a very interesting uh, discussion on the topic, digital justice, what should a Caribbean court system fit for the 21st century look like? Uh, without further ado, I would want to ask uh, the CEO of the Copper Foundation to say a few introductory words, and then we will move on to getting this fireside chat on, on, on going. Thank you very much. Hey, thank welcome. you. Thank you so much, Terence, and good afternoon to everyone on our um, esteemed panel. And thank you so much for allowing us to talk a little bit about this also um, groundbreaking project that, result, that revolves around the justice system here in Trinidad and Tobago. The project addressing human rights abuses of remand prisoners with, with a special emphasis on domestic violence cases is actually being implemented by the University of the West Indies through the International Human Rights Clinic out of the Faculty of Law with support and partnership by the Kropper Foundation. And of course, it's funded by the European Union delegation to Trinidad and Tobago. And this project really targets uh, quite a number of innovative things. It's looking at path-breaking litigation in the form of a constitutional challenge that's already been initiated. Uh, that's looking at the remand system that results in undue delay as well as on our side at the Kropper Foundation, providing much needed collective life skills support to both current and former remandees. And the project again is bringing together academia and uh, NGOs to see if we can make a concerted difference in this particular issue of injustice in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the project really emerged out of uh, Professor Rosemary Ballantwine who of course is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Graduate Studies and Research and, and principal elect at St. Augustine. In her role as, as the former Dean of Faculty of Law, where she established the IHRC, the Human Rights Clinic, and some of the initial students from that clinic and who had started on a number of visits and bits of research around this issue of human rights abuses in the Trinidad Tobago Prison Service. And what really emerged out of there was really, you know, this, this very clear picture of uh, an entrenched and serious set of human rights travesties of remand injustice, which really in the Caribbean was only second at the time to Haiti. And of course, first in the, um, or well, the worst in the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, you know, some of the terms, some of the facts are really shocking, you know, more than you know, 2,200 persons are currently in, in remand with over a third of them being there for more than five years and over 12% being there for more than 10 years and some even more than 20 years, more than two decades. And of course, for those of you who may not know, a person in remand, according to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, is any person charged with a criminal offense um, who has been ordered by the court to be detained in custody while awaiting trial or sentencing. So these are people who are waiting more than two decades in some cases without even proven guilty or getting a fair sentence. So this work, this, this, these shocking facts really set the groundwork for the project with its innovative litigation, as well as the understanding that these people are people within a network and a community, and therefore, you know, helping support the social and economic needs of these people by bringing civil society together is also really important to this idea of justice. And as I said, a constitutional motion has already been filed uh, in November 2020. Anthony Albert et al. 
uh, with the Attorney General of Tehran Tobago. And it's a joint, joint effort by the Faculty of Law led by Professor Rosemary Balantwine in partnership with the with Trinity Chambers. And it's really testing out, it's really meant to bring to light those serious injustices within the remand system. And again, with a focus on gender inequality. And uh, just to end up with my five minutes, you know, the Kruber Foundation is not usually seen as a, an NGO that, that works in this space, but the idea of justice is very core to the work that we do at the foundation. And uh, this work really is meant to help us as a member of civil society inform how we view justice within the Caribbean. Because another element of the work, again, while I'm not an attorney at law, you know, the aspects of digital justice, I would believe will also include the systems within which these people live and exist, and many of whom have not yet been sentenced for crimes uh, for which they've been charged. And at the launch of the project on April 21st, we were lucky to hear from a former Rimandi who painted a, 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 well, a frankly horrendous picture of a disconnected and dehumanizing experience for persons in Rimand. And of course, you know, the general opinion of people are that, oh, well, they're criminals and they've, they've gotten what they deserve. But these are people who have not yet even been tried or convicted for a crime. Yet they're denied the equivalent exposure to, to things that persons who have been tried and, and charged obtain. And this languishing without opportunities that could be provided digitally to them is exacerbated by the fact that they're also disconnected from, them, from their families, relying on very rare uh, in-person visits, which of course we all know constitutes the cyclical issue with um, ongoing crime, which of course can once again be helped if we had a more, even monitored digital communication system. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not an attorney or person with any justice feel like our colleagues here, but I mean, the fact that someone can, can languish without trial for two decades is really inconscionable. And, uh, you know, the development of an efficient digital system that supports um, more informed uh, systems within the, within the, the courts um, could really go a long way in mitigating these blatant human rights abuses. So the, the combination of, of digital concepts and justice, I think is close to, um, to anyone who, have, who has lived over these last two years in the pandemic. And I think we need to quickly understand the importance that these opportunities afford to us. Uh, and this project, of course, is focusing on remandies and advancing the cause of justice for everyone who might find themselves in that situation. So I, thank, I want to thank the organizers again for letting us uh, talk about this a bit. And if anyone wants to find out more information, please, you can visit us on Facebook at Human Rights Advocacy UE to learn more about the upcoming project activities. So thank you so much again, Terence, and I'll hand it back over to you. Yes, Dean. Efron will now introduce the speakers and we will begin the fireside chat. Dean Efron, over to you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Omar, for uh, those words about the Cropper Foundation. And we do hope that we continue uh, to work with, work with you and also to grow some of the work, I think very much a range of issues on justice and essentially to ensure that the rule of law applies as uh, we grow as a society and in particular let's say as we think about the last few years in terms of COVID-19 and the different changes that has brought about to society. So I would like to uh, welcome everybody let's say the fireside chat that we, style that we are going for. And Terence has already introduced uh, the two speakers today. So I'm going to begin and um, ask a first question, which essentially builds on what Terence has briefly mentioned on what Omar has discussed uh, in terms work that the Cropper Foundation do, but when we are thinking of our legal systems and how they're going to evolve in the future, um, I was wondering, Camille, could you set the scene for us in terms of how the courts and technology um, 
have begun operation and how they've maybe been affected, you know, over the last couple of decades, but also particularly in light of maybe the accelerated move uh, in terms of digitalization of our economies, of our society, in particular over the uh, COVID period. Sure. Thank you, uh, Rafael. And um, thank you to Terry and all the supporting cast at UWI uh, for putting this together. Um, it's always a pleasure to be among so many Trinidadians. So thank you for that. Um, you know, the, Brit the courts in Trinidad and the Caribbean have really uh, a legacy of the court system you have in the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom courts probably go back a thousand years. So the court practice, the court procedure, even the buildings, the language, the way people dress, all of that is part of a huge legacy. Um, however, as we move forward, there's a sort of generational shift in the way people see things. You know, people under 20 or 30 would see things very differently from people over 50. And there's consensus that there's a need for change. Um, and the pandemic has highlighted that significantly. Um, so what do you have if you look at a sort of before and after? If you took, you know, uh, let's say 2019 or thereabouts when the pandemic started, you had a court system which was really very costly. Um, and I know legal cost in general is very high. It was, it used a language and it was significantly, you know, heavy on paper. It is a sort of paper-based <clears throat> model. Um, it was to the man in the street, it was difficult to understand. It took a long time uh, to get things done. And you had a system really which, you know, had significant delays. And a delay really means that, um, you know, you're denying justice in many, in many respects. They, along came the pandemic and, you know, we had, you know, a whole new digital architecture being designed to deal with the court system. And uh, I understand in Trinidad, you know, most if not all courts now are, are run on a digital basis. So what then took place, I think, and it's interesting to see after the pandemic, if we'll go back, is you had a structure where using a digital uh, structure, uh, um, court structure, you had more access, uh, it was less expensive, you probably had um, and will have, as you go along, less lawyer content. It would be led more by the litigant in person. Uh, as you go on, you would have much simpler language. You would have a, a digital architecture that is based on the user, not on the lawyer or the judge. And so what you move from is you move from having a court to having a service. And that is a significant difference. Um, because what, for example, you found in the UK is that there was a rise in alternative dispute resolution, uh, non-court matters, non-court solutions, if you like, uh, mediation, conciliation, and uh, online dispute resolution. So the court became more of a service in that sense rather than a physical building. Having said that, you have a rise in conflict uh, we have become a much more litigious society. Um, you have a, a huge amount of conflict taking place in all aspects. And if you look, for example, take eBay, there are something like 60 million disputes. Alibaba, 100 million disputes. Facebook, 90 million disputes. But what is significant about those disputes is that something like 89 to 95% of those disputes are settled online. And this is really one of the big differences. So to sort of give you the frame, we have a, a largely paper heavy uh, structure. Uh, we have something which is a paper based institution uh, pre pandemic. And then post pandemic, we have something which is basically digital. Now, what, what that meant is that, you know, there was a really a very large unplanned rethink of justice, maybe the largest unplanned rethink of justice in history. And suddenly within a period of, for example, in the UK of six months, you had to have courts online. You have to have judges having more discretion to deal with 
procedure and having to dispense with many more procedures. You had new offenses, for example, of uh, not uh, preventing the video, uh, the distribution of videos of court cases. That became a significant matter. You had uh, more um, procedures to allow public access to hearings and so on. You had jury trials, which were partly at home and partly in court. You had a mix uh, structure. Um, what you perhaps did not have is, for example, good accommodation of the client lawyer discussions, for example, which uh, are not always easy. Or in family law matters, where you had a child's interest or several children's interests and several lawyers, you know, looking at that on screen became very difficult, uh, where you had many parties involved. So, you know, the pandemic did a very good thing. It made us really quickly have to settle into something which was digital. It made us very quickly aware that what we have was not fit for purpose. And the real question is, you know, how are we going to deal with the period post pandemic? Are we going to go back to physical courts or are we going to have a structure where we have a service, uh, which is to say we have uh, a whole different way in which we resolve disputes? So that's a rather long-winded answer, Rafael. But um, you know, I think it gives you a flavor of uh, what we're dealing with. Thank you. Um, some of some of the content contents of what you said make me reflect on uh, something that I was told when I was in in law school was that the the good lawyer will keep you out of court. So. They sh you should always uh, be able to negotiate and make sure you don't end up in court. So um, maybe maybe lawyers have got better. Um, <laughs> the the education is getting better, but um, we can talk about that. Uh, but I did, in a similar way to some of the things you mentioned there, yeah, uh, to to hear from uh, Alistair about maybe why you think, Alistair, the court system has lagged behind on technology and why it has been resistant to change? So, sorry, well, yes, uh, sorry, the, uh, the system just asked me to restart my video. Um, I will, uh, uh, thank you having me, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, I've spent 34 years of my life as a, as a, as a consultant, financial services, a change agent in the UK defence, uh, and a CIO in, uh, in global banks like HSBC, uh, trying to drive digitisation and modernisation. So the first thing I'd say to your question is, all industries uh, have a huge resistance uh, to modernization and change, and that is, that is true of, uh, of modernization of the court system um, for many reasons. You know, it's an individual, it's a natural human instinct uh, to resist uh, change, uh, and uh, the natural human instinct uh, to be resistant to uh, digitization. Um, getting the business case right to do change is a remarkably complex thing because often the people that will incur the cost are not the same people that will incur the benefits uh, and therefore it's actually very difficult even it may be logical uh, to a number of us as to why we should get change in any industry uh, it can actually be uh, it can actually be very complex and another huge reason that applies particularly to court transformation it's really, really, really difficult. Uh, it's kind of easier to do the sexy front end bit or make an app or something. Um, but when you look at uh, when you look at the, the court system, it is a complex technology. It's application, it's front end, and it's data, um, and it's very difficult to organise the right skills. So in general, um, this is a difficult thing to do. And then when you move into the specifics of uh, the legal injustice, then you add the sort of tradition and the pomp and circumstance, the pomp and the pageantry. Uh, I think that is another uh, 
convocation. It was interesting in the UK pandemic, and uh, Camille was giving some great examples of us having to uh, change. But if you actually look at the UK Parliament, it was probably the one area that uh, really struggled to conduct its business locally because there's hundreds and hundreds of years worth of uh, tradition. And I think there's just an element of that in the in the court and the legal system as well. And the court and the legal system is tied to ideology of uh, about uh, of the state, um, and uh, and that uh, that's tied to society cer ceremony um, uh, and religious doctrine. And, and this just I think by the very nature makes it uh, more um, resistant to change. Um, COVID nineteen helps has helped to a point, um, but it. But I think we uh, have to uh, separate uh, putting technology at the problem and digitizing the problem. So I think it's slightly different. So we have effectively carried out the same processes as we did. We just did it remotely through technology. Um, there has been a lot of progress in the UK in um, uh, Her Majesty's courts and tribunal system launched a a major digitization and modernization program in 2016. And indeed, there have been a number of uh, digitization projects, particularly for some sort of uh, civil uh, cases, such as uh, divorce, probate, um, social security, please. Uh, and indeed, uh, my own company, Capita, are very involved in uh, e incarceration. Um, so we, we do a lot of the electronic monitoring uh, in the UK, to uh, which we have to, we're monitoring 25,000 subjects uh, to, uh, to avoid physical incarceration. So um, again, there is, uh, there is a bit of progress, but it's probably slower than uh, a lot of other uh, industries. And then you get into this sort of moral debate about yeah. well, start digitizing court systems, are you creating a two-tier society? Um, because not everyone has access, uh, not everyone has the skills, uh, and are you disenfranchising a certain uh, part of society? Uh, well, to conclude, I, I, and then of course, in, in a, in a post-COVID world, uh, particularly in UK, um, uh, with uh, potentially a uh, recession not too far away and other things to uh, stimulate the economy, um, there, there, there is, of course, uh, funding issues. Um, so I think there's, there's a whole host of issues, uh, in my view, mm -hmm. um, addition, uh, cost, and just complexity are probably the biggest ones. I mean, if I could just add there, Rafael, yeah. I mean, Al makes a really important point regarding pageantry with the court system and tradition. And if you were designing a court system now, you'll never design it as you have at present. I mean, all new companies are basically flat. And if you look at the structure of justice in most countries, in Sydney, most common countries, it's very siloed. If you want something done, you probably have to see three ministries including a commission of votes or something to get very simple things done. That would not happen anymore if it's digitalized. And I think the second point is that, you know, there has been the rise of a lot of personal computers and technology has come a long way since the old days. So people are now familiar with using and accessing information and data very easily. And I think also there has been a sort of behavioral change. Um, if you go back to the idea of nudge, a very interesting book written by Cass Sunstein and, um, you know, which nudges people to do things. And a lot of the digital architecture is designed to nudge you into getting a solution. So we now live in a world where you could, um, you know, get things done online. If you have very good fonts and drop down menus and so on, you could sort of work your way through to find a solution. And uh, it has become easier you know, the old story, if you sell, would people buy a whole apple or would they buy a cut up apple? Well, if you make it easy, they'll buy that product. And I think as we move along, um, things have become easier in a digital way. Thank you. And um, let's say 
related to that point uh, that you've just made, Camille, I mean, I mean, could you maybe say uh, something about, you know, what what type of cases from uh, more digitalization would they be bigger cases or yeah. do you think it's more smaller cases could be uh, could greatly benefit from digitalization? I mean, it's a very, very good question. Um, I would say to answer your question straight, smaller cases, uh, the low value cases. Um, however, if you have large cases, I mean, a terrorist case in the UK has probably 3 million pieces of paper. So if you have a digital structure, the sharing of that information is much easier in a big case. But if you focus on small cases, and let me give you a really interesting example. If you don't pay your tax on time, or file your, rather, if you don't file your return on time, you're charged 100 pounds in the UK. So there's a 100 pound penalty for the late filing of a tax return. There are 1.6 million 100 pound penalties. And every one of them has a right to appeal that fine in a tribunal. And every decision given by a judge on those cases can also be appealed. So what you have is you spend between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds for a day in court with a judge to collect 100 pounds. And then there's a right of appeal. What you have is, you know, um, you, have, you could get rid of that if you had a very good structure for dealing with small cases. So, you know, traffic court, for example, any disputes below $15,000, let's say, or $20,000, non-payment of fines. You know, these are all areas where you can have a digital structure for settling. Um, I think uh, probate would be a very good example. Probate is essentially a form funding exercise. And again, if you had a structure that allowed someone to complete forms very accurately, you will not necessarily have all these 15 or 20 minute hearings in court, which basically clogs up the court, you know. Yeah. So smaller cases, you know, um, less court time, less judge time and solution based. Uh, British Columbia has a fantastic uh, solution explorer for small claims court. And they have basically replaced the small claims court with something which is an online dispute settlement platform. Um, you know, all of these small cases are really cases which can be dealt with very quickly and, uh, and very easily using uh, some sort of digital structure. And again, coming back to the idea of nudge, you know, where you make it easy for people to do things and you provide a pathway to a solution, you'd find that, you know, a very good uh, interface between the solution and the problem so you move from a more confrontational system of lawyers and judges and defense and so on to a more solution-based uh, structure where people work together um, to solve a problem. Thank you. And um, just, to, uh, just to say to the audience that, you know, do... Uh, keep your questions in mind. We do have a Q&A session at the end, and it is a great chance to hear uh, some different perspectives from your questions that you may have from two uh, global experts. Um, so it is a great opportunity. So get those questions uh, ready. Um, in terms of let's say, thinking about what Camille just said in terms of solutions. Um, I just wanted to maybe go back uh, a small bit, uh, Alistair, and maybe touch on something that you, you touched on, let's say, at the, the end of when you were speaking last. But, you know, when we're thinking of the, the COVID crisis um, and we're thinking of that acceleration in uh, the need and the utilization of technology. Um, you know, what do you think in, in the context of the court system? How has it impacted? Has, is, has it been, 
you know, in in terms of maybe a timeline, how how much has 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 have these issues been accelerated? Is it is it five, ten, fifteen years? I mean, uh, what's what's the real story behind all of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a good question, and it's such a good debate. And it's uh, you know the answer is definitely to a point. Um, uh, and, and no, Raphael, I don't think it's accelerated port modernisation by five or ten years or anything like it. What it has done is demonstrated that with a particular burning platform, uh, society is capable of doing great things. But you asked the question about technology. Are we talking about technology or are we talking about digitization? If you're talking about technology, yes, we were able to do what we used to do in a courtroom and apply and roll out really impressively a huge amount of technology infrastructure so that you can effectively dial into the courtroom and replicate some of the processes. And that was really impressive. Um, it demonstrates what governments can do and how uh, all, all stakeholders in the court system can adapt. But I think that's still a baby step towards, um, uh, towards the overall modernization. The real plot prize is when you integrate people and the process and data with that technology. And in the court system, we probably have the most fragmented data and non-digitized data uh, of, of any government process. The data is literally in huge paper stores spread yeah. around. So I, I think it's a sort of, um, I think it's helped nudge, uh, it, it's shown what's possible, it's helped nudge towards perception, maybe broken down a little bit of the barriers as has, you know, we probably wouldn't have imagined doing a session like this uh, three years ago, and now that. But um, do I do I think it is smooth dial? Uh, no, um, and and I think governments are also going to uh, have other things to uh, you know, to spend the money on. So I, I you know I, I think it's a bit of yes and no there. Thank you, and. Um... I was just wondering, Camille, um, in terms of the use of uh, digital technology, um, you know, I know you have, uh, you work on projects in different countries, in particular in America, but um, can you maybe uh, give your, your view on whether, um, you know, how are some other countries utilizing digital technology? Ha has there been, you know, some success or effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, an excellent question. I mean, there are many lessons from uh, other countries. Um, you know, the, the, the message that tech is technology can disrupt traditional ways of doing things. That's the core message we have uh, and have had um, post-pandemic about, you know, what can be done, which is to say that the reporting of court matters, the making of decisions, uh, the storing of information, uh, even the rehabilitation of uh, offenders, et cetera, can all be done differently. And that is true. And many countries have done things differently. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, British Columbia has an online uh, small claims court, which, you know, operates on its own. Uh, it operates without a judge. Of Obviously, 85% of the cases are settled online, uh, something like 10% need a telephone inquiry and 6% uh, really go to the court. So what you have is a much more tiered structure uh, where the first stage is looking at what you can resolve using the, the digital architecture. And then if you really can't get a decision, you go to the court. Uh, in the United States, for example, is a system called Matterhorn and Matterhorn is used in about 33 states and it's operated, again, uh, a way of solving smaller claims from your mobile phone. And as Al would tell you, the mobile phone is now the biggest court in the world. Um, forget all the big fancy buildings, which you wouldn't need in 10 years' time. So don't build any more buildings. Just use your mobile phone. Uh, in Turkey, for example, um, the whole court system has been replaced with something electronic. 
So you can't get onto the court structure without filing papers electronically. And, and in Portugal, Al spoke about the um, collection of penalties. We have about a billion pounds of fines which are go uncollected. Uh, Portugal has a debt collection platform uh, that nudges you into paying your fine. So for example, it would say, you know, 50% of people have paid their fine within seven days. And that's a great nudge because the, the next thing you'd want to do is pay your fine and be part of that 50%. Um, one of the things um, which I found interesting is uh, in Romania and some countries in former Eastern Bloc, there's, um, there's a voice recognition uh, service for judges. Now, this is not new technology. You have it on your mobile phone. But you, you, as you speak and give evidence, is recorded, if you like, what a stenographer would have done and is recorded in real time. So quite often judges, when they're sitting, they'd say, can you repeat that? And can you hold on a minute? And, and, and the sense that one has is that the judge is not actively listening. But if everything is being immediately transcribed using a digital uh, system, you will not have that sort of structure. But perhaps the best place, and Al is familiar with uh, Estonia and Finland, and he'll tell you why in a second, but um, Estonia really takes the cake and that, you know, really is a structure which start to finish, you know, whether it be the police, the arrest, the court, the decision, the judge, the probation service, the prison is all linked. They've connected the dots. And really, you can't do anything without being going on a digital structure in Estonia. And, um, you know, where you would take, you know, sort of 104 days to get to court in the old British structure. You could probably do that in two weeks in Estonia. Uh, I think I'm right in saying Estonia is a real leader, Al, would you say? Yeah, Estonia always comes up as, uh, as one of the leaders in this field, um, as, as do parts of China as well, uh, where they have uh, still have a a AI judges. But uh, Finland, uh, and my wife is Finnish, so I consider myself half Scot, half Finnish. Uh, and it is a society where uh, people are relatively well known for being, um, you know, less interactive, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, and there are a huge number of uh, civil court cases, um, uh, divorces, are all done without going anywhere near a physical building, and that's becoming... Uh, but the, but the, the, these societies are far, far more digital, so Estonia and Finland would be uh, more advanced irrespective mm -hmm. of what uh, of what process you were talking about. Thank you. And um, you know, maybe just following some of the the discussion over the last uh, few minutes, I just wondered, uh, you know, what what maybe both of you think of, you know. Part of, uh, let's say, what Camille talked about earlier is, you know, the existing system. And I, I think you referred to the, Alistair, to some of the infrastructure. And, and we think that, you know, despite things maybe moving in a digital way, uh, won't there be some people who, you know, they will always want, um, let's say, you know, you know, they they like the system there because it, it gives people a voice. And if you like, if you, if, if you think even more cynically, it gives people their day, you know, their big day out in court and to move, to move digitally gets, you know, gets rid of all that. And, uh, you know, there's a whole nearly, uh, sort of, uh, social side of society to watching people get their big day out in court, people leave the steps of court and announce whatever, you know, maybe small victory or even loss that they've just had. Um, so, I mean, is, uh, do, you, do you think that day is over or, you know, how do you think the public will react to that? Uh, I think it's probably getting more and more over every day. I mean, there's a big demographic thing here at the aging. So obviously the, uh, the younger population, uh, uh, you know, are, are already there. Uh, the older population 
uh, Raphael a little bit more of what you talked about sort of dressing up. In fact, we, we had a job <laughs> someone suddenly turned up onto a, a team of call with a, a tie on. <laughs> you know, the joke is all you know, how was the judge? Because, you know, they, they assume that you've uh, they've taken time to, uh, to have that. But no, I mean, you were asking me earlier about um, uh, COVID and has it accelerated digitization? And I gave you quite a cautious response. But if, if the question um, has COVID moved public perception to be more open to different uh, types of court systems, then I absolutely think it has, particularly, particularly as uh, you know, the, the younger uh, population age. But it's nuanced. The, the perceptions, I think, are quite nuanced. They're quite complicated. They're, they're intertwined with trust, emotion, scepticism, maybe lack of trust, um, uh, and there are other, you know, individual liberties. There are, there are complex uh, uh, issues. But in general, I, I think that will go really quickly. What do you think, Camille? Well, I think, I mean, you're right. People, you know, do want to day in court, but I think it could be a generational thing. I mean, if you look at the under 30s, um, you know, in terms of how they operate, uh, if they want to share a picture, they just share it immediately, electronically. Um, if they want to find out where something is, they ask Alexa, you know. Um, and um, so they operate in a much different way. Um, and I think there's a sort of cultural difference about the day in court. The day in court does not have to be a physical court, <laughs> maybe a digital court. Um, and you may still have some steps to stand up to and make your pronouncements to the public. But I think, you know, quite seriously, what, what the digital structure does, it focuses on needs and interests rather than rights and power. It moves away from the adversarial system. Uh, it shifts from uh, human decision-making to automated uh, decision-making. So the role of the lawyer is reduced, perhaps, and the role of the judge is reduced. As Al said, in China, you already have these courts. And there's a shift away from confidentiality, if you like, to more open access. Uh, information is shared. Um, it can still be confidential, of course, but it's, it's shared in a different way. So I think um, the day in court thing is, is interesting. You, you, know, you know, you may still have your day in court, but it may be a, a digital court rather than a, a physical court. Um, and I think, I think, you know, uh, young, I mean, younger people, younger than me, certainly, and me and maybe Al, uh, you know, they, they have a different uh, need. Um, they are happy to, you know, be more instant and more electronic and more technological. They share things on TikTok and, and uh, this sort of way. Um, they, I think their mindset is very different. And we are looking at the future here. So we are looking at a system that would work for them. Um, not necessarily people in wigs and gowns, if you like. <laughs> Thank you. And... Let's say uh, related to that, I, I was just thinking, you know, what, um, you know, some people will always think that even, you know, if we get, if we thought of an example in terms of evidence coming, coming from my own uh, particular area, if we're looking at things like the environment or climate change, we will have thousands of pages of documentation. And let's say some people will always want to have that documentation in front of them rather than, you know, some digital uh, documents, et cetera, et cetera. What's your, what's, you know, that sort of, uh, uh, let's say that point of view in terms of thinking about the, the loss of that sort of physical structure of a court where you have everything, uh, in the courtroom, you have the documentation, um, it's all on paper, and then this total move to having everything digital. Well, I don't know, I think that, yeah. Well, I think we both probably got a point of view. I mean, uh, the, there are lots of challenges of digitizing the paper. Um, I actually think the 
uh, individual perceptions of the value of having a piece of paper versus having some information uh, digitally is the least of our concern. Mm-hmm. And they will pass that in all other processes. It's not really an issue. Yeah, yes, with uh, with Dom and yes, there is a you know uh, a, you know from access that we can get past. But by far the bigger issue is is the complexity of digitizing that paper. Um, you know, I uh, we're all we are all amateur process engineers these days, aren't we? When we when we travel or whether when we uh, apply for a passport or whether we when we interact with our government in any way, we all observe, well, hang on, I've just given you that data five minutes ago. Why am I giving you that data again? If you were to map out the business process and map of, of going through, you know, even a medium complexity uh, port process, and map out the flow of paper, and where it's stored and how it's accessed, then you would fill up a very large piece of paper with a very large number of boxes, one of the most complex uh, processes uh, that we have. Um, and that requires a lot of investment. Um, and, and it goes back earlier to what I'm saying, the custodians of that investment are not necessarily sure. going to be uh, the custodians of the benefits of the experience of, of having everything in one place. Um, so I don't think public perception will be as big an issue uh, as the complexity of digitization. And, and I can tell you that when I think of the amount of paper in the justice system in the UK, as a chief executive of Capita, I'm rubbing my hand thinking about all this. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as far as I can tell, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, there are 160 million pieces of paper in the Ministry of Justice, apparently. Um, and the, um, you know, the, 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 there's a great challenge in integrating that amount of paper into a different structure, as I would say. Um, you know, the government are committed to doing it, and I'm sure in Trinidad it's the same. They're committed to creating a, a digital structure. Um, it will take time. I mean, there's a cultural issue, as you rightly pointed out, Raphael. Um, there's a cultural issue in the sense that there is normally a resistance to change. Um, people feel that they have something, you know, going on, and the change is not easy. Um, but the question is: Are we going to have something which is better, which is smarter, and which is cheaper? And the answer, in my mind, is yes. We we now live in a world where you have people working from home, um, you know, you have a gig economy, um, you have a whole different way in which the workplace exists. Um, you have issues of diversity and inclusion arising continually. How do we deal with the vast spectrum of people uh, from different backgrounds and who have different challenges and so on? And the, the answer seems to be that if you have something which is digital, it would work better but you have to get it right. The test eventually is, you know, is it serving the people and is it fit for purpose? And if the answer to those two things is yes, then, you know, we could sign off on the structure we have, whichever one it may be, I should add. Okay, let me, uh, if I may, just add a, an example to highlight the complexity here. A particular process that we did some work on in the UK Ministry of uh, Justice Camille knows about this. The subject access request. So where a, an offender is has the right uh, to request all the information that the, the legal system, the justice system holds about them, that they, they can request that data. There's a huge uh, building in UK, happens to be called the Branson Building after Branson Pickle, but that's just the end of sight. 200 people in it, no data, and their only job is to get these requests, work out where the data is, which is in data stores all over the country, and within a legal requirement of 90 days, which they struggle to, uh, to adhere to, to get the data, to copy the data, to, uh, uh, to mark the bits that are not allowed, and then to uh, pass it back. So. Um, yeah, I, I would love to see the day that we were uh, working out the data was on the screen, but 
you know, this, this is the complexity of digitization. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder for the audience to think about some uh, questions. I've had one or two sent to me directly, but you, you will be able to ask in yourself as well. But um, going on, um, let's say it has been touched on uh, briefly by both of you already. Um, but I was just wondering, um, overall, how do you make a, a user um, comfortable in using a digital court system? And, and let's say we can think of the broad range of users from, from young to elderly people um, who may have to interact. So what would be good ways or methods to make uh, all users that bit more comfortable uh, with this transition? I think, Al, you better take that one. You're more familiar with that kind of infrastructure point. Well, uh, sorry, is it the question about infrastructure? Yeah. How do you make users well, more comfortable? Yeah. Yeah, the, the user, or, or if, if you like, the the user experience, let's say, I, I would I wouldn't like to use the word customer experience. Well, if you break the user down into I don't know, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, of the process, so I, I've, I've already explained you know how complex and how fragmented uh you know, a, a process is so if you're a user whether whether that be a judge or a magistrate or a, a witness uh, or a, a perpetrator um, um the uh, speed of the process would be vastly improved because the integration of People, process, technology, and data uh, would be uh, would be significantly faster. So I think, like like anything, um, uh, instead of lots and lots of handoffs and uh, lots of uh, uh, uncertainties, um, it, it would feel a lot more seamless. Um, and then the second point is is the quality and consistency and, and trustworthy. Of customers of the decisions. So if you want to know the price of bread and you ask one person, you'll get a view. If you ask a hundred people what the price of bread is, you'll get a different view. If you ask a thousand people, and the more people you ask, the more accurate that uh, that view will be. And so when you start to apply data to the legal decisions, uh, the consistency of these and the trustworthy of these decisions Will, will improve significantly. And you know, uh, Camille and I have been trying to uh, convince the UK justice system for a couple of years to uh, parole decisions, for example, just to uh, just to be uh, more uh, data driven. So ultimately, I think there's a massive benefit uh, to the citizen. I mean, just elaborating on that point, the point which Al made, um, we were looking at algorithms. I was working with someone at Penn University of Pennsylvania, um, and Al and Capita. Essentially, if you use an algorithm to predict, for example, reoffending. So let's say you had a hundred people, let's say you had a parole board, and the parole board had to make a decision on a hundred people to give them parole. We found that um, you know the parole board would be 68% accurate in predicting people who would reoffend. But if you use simply 10, 10 variables, such as when did you commit your first crime? Was it a violent crime? Do you come from a family of criminals, et cetera? There are 10 variables we use that we could predict at 92% rate who would reoffend. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you had 100 people and you think only 20 would reoffend, then your resources could be allocated to those 20 people. You don't have to have a probation officer for each of the 100 people. You may only need 20 probation officers. You could put an ankle bracelet on the remaining 80, 
get them to check in the police station. But you know that these 20, you could refuse parole, for example, or you could release them with under certain conditions. Um, but the point is that you could put your resources in that group. And this is not, you know, there are many, many areas where um, you could predict reoffending. You could predict where crimes would take place. Uh, if you look at the hotspot research from Professor um, Sanders at Cambridge, you'll see how that can be. You know, using technology, I mean, if you gave, for example, a person in prison um, an iPad so that just within the prison you had an intranet so they could tell, for example, the prison warden, I am diabetic and I need a special meal. And that information went to the person. A, a reply came back, thank you for your your uh, come back in 48 hours. A large part of the control of the prison population has to do with they don't feel they're being heard. So just having an intranet in prison with a small iPad would allow you to control the atmosphere in the prison. You could also put you know, courses from Coursera or Edemy uh, or Allison.com and so they could learn you know, basic plumbing, how to fix a bike, you know, um, how to how to fix, how to become an electrician so that they feel their life is progressing. Uh, there's a lot can be done with rehabilitation of offenders. Um, and in particular, I think Omar spoke about um, people who are on remand who may eventually not be convicted of any crime. Uh, you could have virtual hearings with them, for example, on remand. You know, having a person on remand just wasting away in prison for a year is a ridiculous thing. It's a breach of their human rights soon to start with. So, you know, using technology, um, anchoring it really uh, by giving people more information and having more control of the data and the way the data is used to, to deal with people. And the data itself corrects the system as you go. So as they find problems, you'd be aware of what those problems are and you correct them. You know, for example, you know, the typeface may have to be bigger, the fonts may be bigger. You could highlight, you could say, you know, 80% of people who said, you know, my mother was ill, it was not a good excuse for not paying your tax on time. You know, you could give nudges like that to make the system work. So there's a lot, not just the court system, but there's a lot that can be done to really propel a more efficient, smarter decision-making within the whole judicial system and yeah. prison system. I'd love to just add to that, Camille, because I, I mentioned earlier about the uh, you know, what, one of the reasons that we haven't progressed further is the complexity of giving a business case. You always need cost and benefits. And I think what you've just been talking about there, which is reducing well, reducing incarceration, uh, either reducing first time uh, incarceration or, or reoffending. Um, is is actually a massive uh, uh, part of the business case, and, and Will and I are both yeah. uh, passionate um, uh, 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 on this topic. Uh, and I mentioned that we do electronic monitoring, uh, for example, and that is uh, using technology. Uh, the business case is much cheaper to have an electronic electronic tag than uh, in a prison. Uh, and we're also using advanced technologies uh, such as alcohol monitoring tags. A lot of uh, UK crime is alcohol induced. And so instead of incarcerating someone, um, you can put a tag that uh, stops them from uh, partaking in alcohol. Um, and, so, and I really think that uh, improving the efficiency of the court system is another key contributor to, uh, uh, to keeping people outside the custodial system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, just just let's say uh, very quickly and, and maybe to put you on the spot, um, both of you on the spot, is uh, just before we fully open out to a QA and a with uh, everyone here. Um, so very briefly, um, you know, we've been talking about digital justice uh, for, let's say, close to um, close to an hour. And um, in, in a nutshell, really, what would a digital court for you look like? So, uh, you know, give me your 60 second, two minute version. <laughs> you, better, you better go with the expert first, which is Al. <laughs> 
uh, it, 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 it would be a seamless process uh, by which uh, the, the process would become consistent and data-driven, uh, and you wouldn't need to enter any physical buildings, and you leave the process um, with a lot more trust that the right decisions have been made. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I would just say that connecting the dots between data, courts, prisons, litigants, and person probation, so that you have, as Al said, a great word, seamless structure, uh, which allows you know the whole thing to be connected and used maybe from your mobile phone. Thank you. And, um, you know, narrowing stuff down such as a definition for a digital court, I imagine will be the work of many a re legal research academic all over the world over the next five years. So um, they, if they have been listening today, they will have heard two definitions, let's say that they can begin uh, those research papers on. But we have one question uh, already in the chat, which I, I will read out, but anyone else, you know, feel free to put up your hand or put it in the chat. I'll read it out or alternatively, you know, you can ask that question yourself. I have a few more sent to me, but um, let's say the question here from, uh, I think it's Valerie Kelsick is, thus far you have focused on litigation and dispute resolution Describe more of the, in terms of the application and impact in other aspects of the justice system. So I know that maybe Camille, you touched a small bit on some of these mm -hmm. issues, but thinking about prevention and restitution, where, where would, uh, you know, the digitalization of the, let's say of the legal system come in there? Yeah, I mean, the emphasis really is on, we talked a lot about litigation, and it's a very fair question. I think um, one of the areas that really uh, interests me is the area of rehabilitation of offenders. And, um, you know, I have set up a charity called Project Remake, uh, where we work with Capita. And um, we basically, I my feeling is that a lot can be done in the area of rehabilitation of offenders, the prison prison law, if you like. Um, to create a more electronic and a, a more efficient structure for rehabilitation, which is not just locking people up, but teaching them various skills, which allows them to re-enter society. Um, I think, for example, in larger commercial transactions, I've been involved in a fair amount of big ticket uh, tax litigation um, when I was um, a partner in a law firm. And, um, you know, that... Um, Really, you know, the, the dealing with uh, information in the tax world, comparative tax structures, for example, uh, cross-border tax, et cetera. I think uh, using information from dis different jurisdictions and getting it quickly and sharing it quickly has been something that has worked well. I mentioned probate, uh, which tends to be something which is, you know, paper-based and which can be um, made much more efficient. Uh, the raising of finance. Um, my daughter is a, a general counsel of a hedge fund, <laughs> believe it or not. And she um, often has a lot of her uh, work relating to the raising of finance done, you know, on a cross-border basis, again, uh, using um, electronic means to do that. So you get a, a deck presented to you all online and there's a, a, a huge community of investors and, um, you know, you, you just read straight onto that and you can easily immediately say whether you're interested or not interested and then move to the second stage and third stage and fourth stage. And you could actually commit money online in financing different uh, project financing. You know, I mean, there's no end to intellectual creativity when you come to, to data and using electronic structures for all aspects of law, not just litigation. Thank you. Um, so we have a questions. I'll, I'll try and take them in order. So uh, Omar, 
Do you want to go Watch ahead and ask your question? Hi, uh, Camille, you actually, perfect introduction. Um, I'm uh, one of the mentees that was on uh, Camille Khan's um, Project Remakes course, and absolutely amazing. But so what I would like to say is about the prison system. I served seven years in prison, UK prison, and I went to court loads of times. And I found from the prisoner perspective, they didn't really like to be transported because they run the risk of losing their cell. They run the risk of losing property. And for the prison, I think it it's the cost incurred of just transporting people to and fro London. And it's it, there should be a digital hub within the prison because one, it can actually cater for um, the court process, but it can actually allow for the job center to be involved universities to be involved because that phys uh, that digital structure could be used of course for the courts but then on other days it could be used you know for universities maybe to provide online teaching and and so forth and yeah I always found when I was in prison that the officers found it frustrating you're wake you're woken up at half five in the morning you're taken across London just to say yeah my name's Omar and go back to your cell you find that actually you you actually get to the prison, it's locked out, so you have to go to another prison and all the problems that arise there, you know, you're a new face, you have to prove yourself, you have to, you know, find relevant courses, you've lost your job, um, family can't visit you and that's happened multiple times. So I think the digital aspect for the court process in prison would just be, it would, it would be phenomenal, it would change, it would change so much. I mean, if I could just add, Omar, thank you. And Omar has been one of our stars on Project Remake. Um, really outstanding, a great example of, um, you know, a person who has a real vision for themselves. He's now working at Capital, incidentally, thanks to Al. Let me just say that a state of our digital courtroom has been installed at HMP Peterborough, which reduces the need for transporting individuals from prison for court appearances. So the video conferencing center, um, you know, in partnership with HMP, HMPPS, H Her Majesty's Prison, um, has created this virtual courtroom. And uh, it's a project which started in, I think, 2018 or 2019, thereabouts. And uh, essentially it's built around interest in new technology, um, designated areas for court hearing and legal services and links to multiple courts, et cetera. Um, but a dedicated room which operates as a prison. So as they say, bring the mountain to Mohammed um, rather than Mohammed having to go to the mountain. Thank you. Uh, do you want to say anything there, Alistair? Or will I? Uh, I think you've covered it. Uh, Omar is uh, uh, joining Capita uh, very shortly and we're, uh, we're thoroughly looking forward to it. But I think Omar mentioned um, the technology in, in the prison system, and I think COVID has helped significantly. That you know there has been traditionally a, a public perception that if you were to, you know, you know, when iPads and technology were still seen as a luxury item, and there was an element of public, a political public opinion that might say, uh, should people that are incarcerated be given access to luxury items and technology? And I think. COVID has actually wiped uh, all of that uh, type of restriction away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so next up in, in terms of question from Tyler Alexander. Alexander, um, does the Commonwealth Caribbean have a sufficiently developed IT infrastructure to prevent a digitized court system from facing habitual outages or requiring continuous support from expensive international firms? I, I mean, I, I, I assume, leave it at, yeah. I, I assume when the question is expensive firms for within the other, other firms than Capita. But it's a real issue to, to the question and the re- uh, the resilience and security uh, of infrastructure and, you know, government departments. Ability and sophistication uh, to run complex integrated systems uh, it, it is an issue. So I think probably the, 
short answer to the question is uh, not quite. And um, getting past the need for expensive infrastructure providers um, is, uh, it, you know, is, uh, is really important. I mean, you know, there's a World Bank report on this, and it talks about um, something called, um, I have a note here, I'm just reading it, it's called the um, Caribbean Regional Communication Infrastructure Programme. The World Bank loves nice uh, uh, phrases like this. And uh, they have put the, um, let's see what they say here, increased access to high quality, low cost digital co connectivity is about between 53 to 60%. So I, I mean, I'm not an expert at this, um, but you know, I think it's relatively low. But what it does highlight is that if you have a, a very varied, you need a very good internet connection. I mean, I could be in court some days and you have people saying, I can't hear you. What is that? Uh, sorry, I... So, you know, in the UK, you have this problem. I imagine in Trinidad or St. Lucia or wherever, you you have the same problems. Uh, except, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if the if there's a huge digital gap, is a larger digital gap, I should say, between some people and others. So, you know, would a court system work very well where you have poor internet connection? Perhaps not. You know. Thank you. Uh, so, so, next question is going to come from Gus John. Go ahead. So, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm not sure. Right. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Yep. The British government is currently deporting black ex-offenders who have convictions that are long spent without any reoffending for years. I'd like to know from Camille, why should a digital system not be used right now to predict reoffending among that population rather than advancing the often spurious argument that you are protecting the public by deporting those people. Well, you know, Gus, you know, uh, this is a big, um, a huge issue. I know David Lamy very well, and I've discussed this with David. And, you know, as far as I could see, the deporting of people to the Caribbean has essentially been something which could easily be cast as racism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that a person has spent convictions um, a spent conviction rather, um, you know, we have the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 19, what is it, um, 78, which has been amended. And spent convictions are just that, they're spent. They no longer relate to anything. And, you know, the idea that people have served their time, have their convictions spent, and they're still being penalized is an absolute disgrace. Um, and I think you would agree with that. Sure. Um, you know, the... the um, I mean, the project I run, Omar being a great example, we uh, largely people of Caribbean background who have been imprisoned, we take them, you get a course at the University of London, okay, which teaches you entrepreneurship. They're not all going to be entrepreneurs, but it gives them a different trajectory for their life. We build community. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we build, uh, uh, we change the mindset. And then they go to Capita where they have a job placement, okay, for 13 weeks. We now have several people who are permanently employed by capital who have served 10, 15, 20 years in prison. You know, right. they, they have done something wrong, but that doesn't mean because you have stolen something, it doesn't make you a thief for life. Yes. You know, I mean, give me a break here. And um, so, you know, the, um, you know, I, I fully agree with you that this is not even a, 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 dis, a, a question to, to, to discuss, you know, as well as I know, that this is wrong mm -hmm. and it should not happen. And, uh, and why it's being done is, well, we could have different views of that and we know why it's being done. Sure. Well, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and um, I mean, I think the question had, you know, the uh, a risk assessment. And so, you know, Camille mentioned capture uh, employing uh, a large number of uh, ex-offenders in, in, in white collar, 
uh, you know, management yeah. job. Um, and we are absolutely delighted with it. Um, you know, we're, we're getting a, a huge amount of talent um, and diversity in the workforce. And it's a very uh, energizing um, uh, journey for, for our staff. But one of the things that we struggle with initially is actually going through uh, getting security clearances and getting um, uh, governments to sign off on the security clearances because a lot of our clients are uh, government, which is similar, I think, to the uh, uh, to the basis of the question. Um, we are absolutely convinced that there is lower risk from ex-offenders who have been given a second chance uh, than... Um, than many other uh, em employers. So the concept of using AI or technology to make risk-based decisions is absolutely the right one and, and is where I think the real value of digitization uh, lies. Thank you. And um, I hope uh, we can get through the remaining questions in, in the time, but uh, I just have a question here, I think uh, quite an important one, uh, and someone else had also uh, me to ask another question on, a, on the similar issue of essentially privacy, but from Angelique Harewood. Uh, I was wondering about the possible issue pertaining to conflicts arising out of potential data breaches, particularly in criminal litigation and in the more sensitive areas of sexual assault cases, for example. What are the standard safeguards that impact something like that? Ooh. Al, you want to try that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, my, I was sort of, uh, that was a good, good and difficult question. My first reaction was, uh, you know, is holding data digitally in a high secure environment um, higher risk than having uh, briefcases being left and trained. And you know, so I think if you're actually comparing potential uh, uh, data breaches and security issues, digitization is an opportunity to, uh, to improve rather than, uh, rather than otherwise. But um, you know, my, my, my view is that that, sh that should be an opportunity to improve security rather than go back. Yeah, I don't know people different uh, well, yeah, I mean, I am not familiar. I mean, there have been data breaches without without question. Uh, we have the GDPR, which lays out a whole infrastructure for dealing with data, and not everyone abides by all the rules in that. So um, th there's there's definitely data breaches. I am I unfortunately can't answer that question because I don't know much about data breaches, um, but I will say they exist. Um, and the GDPR regulations deal with data breaches, and I'm happy to look at that and come back to you. Well, I can tell, I can tell you that uh, uh, Capita does a huge amount of uh, public services, and if there is a data breach at all that we've been involved in, then I have to personally cha chair the, uh, the uh, major incident board to respond, and that is something that might happen, you know, Every uh, every uh, blue moon, um, and that uh, generally has not happened in uh, in, in the justice environment. Thank you, um, uh, Tony Kelly. Hello. Hey, you're on mute there. You're on mute. Uh, yeah. You have to unmute. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I'm being heard now. Now, that just shows you, I, I am the world's legendary biggest technophobe. So the whole issue of digital <laughs> and me, <laughs> they don't go side by side, they're poles apart. Anyway, going down the digital route, I, I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, I worked in the probation service for 25 years as a probation officer here in England and as a <laughs> senior probation officer in the equality, equity and e inclusion field. Now, what I want the panelists to look at when we're looking at the digital thing and why I'm all for it in a sense is, I'll give you a clear example. Magistrates and judges sentencing black offenders in the court system within England that I worked in, it is a known thing and it's about cultural competence and cultural sensitivity. It's a known thing from I was growing up as a child in Jamaica. 
if you're being told off by an adult or an elderly person, you look sheepish, you look like what would say Marga dog, you look away, you don't eyeball the judge or look straight directly at them. Now, some judges don't realize that that's a cultural thing. And they say, well, look at me, I'm speaking to you. And you're standing up, you're gonna be sentenced by the judge, but you're looking away, you're looking down, anything but eyeballing the judge. How, how, for me, that's the digital bit that I think we might be able to get around that in this sense, because I see that, and I used to see that happening a lot in the courts here, where judges thought that the defendant was being disrespectful by not actually looking at them face to face. I'd like you to comment on that, because some of you are within the British system here, and how the digital will get around that. Well, I think uh, Judge, Judge Cam may be well placed for that one. Yeah, I mean, the, look, there are so many cultural differences. Uh, your point is absolutely valid. Let me start by saying that, that, you know, there is not necessarily an understanding of the cultural background. Um, judges are given training in this area. Um, the training, you know, in my view, is, is, is quite funny and in some respects laughable. It's not just something which, look, let me put this to you, Tony. I hear your point. And let me say this to you. We are working on a system where if you have a parole board and you have a chap with dreadlocks with six drug convictions coming before them to have uh, parole, in the mind of the person looking at that, the, in the mind of the parole officer or the parole board is, I know people like you, there's no way I'm going to give you parole. Okay, so there are two things going on here. And I find this with my charity, and I'd love you to join the charity Project Remake, which is when a person who is black or from ethnic backgrounds, there are two things going on in their mind. One is they know who they are. There's a noise there. One is the person knows who they are. But the second thing is they also, can you go, yeah. They also know what the person they're speaking to and they also know what that person thinks they are. So there are two things going on. One is who they are, and one is who they think the person they're speaking to thinks they are. And it's very interesting because I think this affects their confidence. So for example, at Capita, there's no disclosure that you're dealing with a person who's been to prison. They're just, they're just normal people working in. And, and what we're trying to do is create a structure, a, 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 a digital, a, 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 an algorithm which allows you to make a decision without seeing the face, without knowing they're black, without, you know, in fact, one of the algorithms we have made everyone white. So there's no black people at all. So that the decision being made is being made on the basis of a human being. And, you know, there's an enormous amount of prejudice within the court structure. There's no question about that. And, and you're right in saying that there are cultural differences. Uh, people may use words or look disrespectful or turn their sideways, etc. But, you know, if people don't understand what that means, they could misinterpret it. Up, up to today, there are judges who can't pronounce my name. <laughs> I say to them, can you say Robinson? That has three syllables. Camille has two syllables. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just making a point here regarding uh, differences, cultural differences. I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Tony, but it's a very valid point. Thank you. And um, just before we conclude, we should be finishing up uh, very soon, but we just have one, uh, let's say, quick final question. Uh, back to you, Omar, if you could uh, ask one quick final question and then a couple of quick final responses before we wrap up. Thank you, Raphael. Um, yeah, it's about how technology is actually changing the justice system itself in prison. So how that like, maybe more digital and mobile phones and drones are maybe are forcing prisons to change. That maybe the old idea of how you're confining people, that technology is 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 actually attacking the security to the point where we have to devise a way where you yeah a way to combat that I guess to, or force a way that maybe prisons are more a place of rehabilitation training where people don't feel a need to maybe partaking drugs and and that's a yeah sorry i'm a bit rambling i lost my point a bit sorry that's all right sorry 
I spent quite a lot, of, Omar, I spent quite a lot of my time uh, uh, talking to various seniors in the Ministry of Justice. And um, the, the absolute number one in the UK, I mean, number, number one priority uh, is to uh, reduce reoffending. Uh, re and um, technology in prisons and modernization of prisons it is an absolute huge, huge uh, priority. And in fact, the uh, um, current secretary uh, had a number of us in for breakfast uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on on, the, on that exact point. So, I think it, I think in in the old days it was you know uh, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but you know, you you, you look at. Uh, the politicians' priorities today, um, because of the cost and because of the impact on society, I think uh, there is a, um, a a massive drive to reduce incarceration. The technology is a massive key to that. And I just want to say to Alistair, you know, thank you, you know, thank you for the support you've given me. You know, as someone who served seven years, who never thought I'd be in the position I'm in, yeah, thank you, and, and Camille. you and i would just like to uh thank everyone in the audience and there is a uh comment there also in the chat about some of the success let's say in trinidad and tobago in terms of providing virtual courts um a problem with internet occasionally uh and even even this morning uh but uh thank you to everyone for attending um i think it is a topic that is not going to go away um, and there will be many, many questions. I didn't even get to ask Camille about the role of uh, judges in the future of the, of the courts, the digital court system. So he we're may... Gonna get rid, we're going to get rid of them. Don't worry. Put, put, putting, putting your colleagues out of business. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, could be, that could be a discussion. It would even indicate that the topic is uh, definitely worthy of a part two or part three. You know, there there is always a sequel for the the great move. Um, so uh, it's with that that you know we could be back here talking about this topic in another six months. But thank you to Alistair, thank you to Camille for coming along to join us, um, and hopefully we continue to see you interact. Uh, with uh, UE St. Augustine Faculty of Law uh, events. And to the audience, you know, do follow us online. On We are on all the social media. You can see other events coming up over the next uh, month and also throughout the rest of the year. And I don't know if, uh, Terry, you want to... Um, close say a few closing yes thank you very much uh, dean heffron i too would like to thank all the participants uh camille and and, and alistair uh I, I i'm really really grateful that you you were able to take some time off from your busy schedule to just sit and discuss this in an open forum so that you know, the public can have us uh, some insight into what the future would look like um, from the point of view of digital justice. Um, I have to say that as we move forward as a collective in the Caribbean in particular, um, we have to really begin to look at not where we have just come from, um, but where we are at and where we are going. Um, there's so much on the table to, to explore and it's, you know, the time that is being wasted, for example, going through the pomp and pageantry um, of the judicial system, we can sort of get over these hurdles quite quickly if we use the digital approach. Um, so basically, as Dean Heffron said, it is a way forward and something that we will have to follow up, you know, in the, in the near future, because it's not going to go away. Um, I want to thank Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine um, in particular, because this started with her um, when she was a dean and she gave me the opportunity to move forward on it. 
And I, Dean Heffron, I want to thank you for taking it on, on board and running with it as you came on, you know, you came in recently as the new Dean. Uh, I know it's a challenge. Everything is a challenge that we have to sort of take gracefully and you did so today. I really want to thank you for that. I want to thank your staff, uh, Mrs. Anita Ali, and I want to also thank uh, Mrs. Uh, Alicia Phillips, who was able to sort of pull everything together um, in the final analysis. Uh, without her, uh, we would have had <laughs> some more stumbling blocks to, 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 to deal with. Um, in general, I believe that uh, we as a people need to just keep holding our faith as we move forward. And uh, the Lord Larry Constantine Educational Series is going to be a platform for which we can spring to keep doing things that are meaningful to us. And um, the public, the audience today, I want to thank you for taking the time to just, you know, listening and to contribute. So without all of us coming together, this would not have happened. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, Camille and Alistair again, thank you. And, uh, you know, have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.